I am so pleased when that happens, that uh, when people give full attention to the presenters and don't fiddle with their blackberries during the presentation. Let's hope that uh, continues during the next two presentations, because what you're about to hear is going to be absolutely crucial for the work of CARFA. So without further ado, may I ask Mr. Brian McKay to go ahead with this presentation. Brian? Thank you, Sir George Eileen. Appreciate the introduction. Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Roses, Secretary General, Dr. Green, thank you for this opportunity to address this group. We'll, uh, my name is Brian McKay. I work with TDV Global, and uh, we've been contracted by the CARICOM Secretariat to assist in the uh, development for, of a resource mobilization and sustainability strategy for CARFA. Uh, my presentation today will be looking at, sorry, um, the conceptual framework of sustainability and how we're going to approach that work. We'll touch on uh, some of the points raised by Dr. Walcott's presentation in terms of efficiencies and the impact of CARFA, just to remind ourselves why we're proceeding down this route, and obviously look at the resource requirements of CARFA as we move forward. Um, for us, the framework, we had to uh, bring structure to this process. Um, sustainability is often a misused, misunderstood term. And for us, we've looked at, we've uh, sort of divided it up into organizational sustainability, financial, and then there's the sustainability of services. It's a measure of an organization's ability to fulfill its mission and serve its stakeholders over time. For CARFA, improved sustainability means broader sources of funding, and an enhanced ability to deliver vital services to member states and target populations. What does all that mean? And how is it done? It's basic good governance, strategic leadership, good management, and resource mobilization. You need all those things in order to achieve sustainability. And there's been progress made on all these things. We're not starting from scratch. Strategic framework, you need a vision, you need a mission, you need programmatic and organizational goals. And you need partner and stakeholder engagement. All this is in progress. We, CARFA does have a vision. It has a mission. It does have organizational goals. We'll be looking more at programmatically and, and, and looking at those again as we move forward in the new year. We're hoping to have another strategic planning exercise. Engagement with stakeholders, as you know, you're all here today. Um, I believe you're engaged on a one on bilateral basis, if you will, on an ongoing basis. Governance, that's been decided in the intergovernmental agreement, and there's copies of the agreement at the back where you, there's an executive board and uh, reporting to the Council of Ministers, a technical advisory committee, and a secretariat with an executive director. Um, management is where we're at now and part of the work of the implementation plan is really to look at the policies, procedures, how is CARFA going to work together because it's not all about waiting to co-locate in 2014 in Trinidad. The idea is that the RHIs are, operate as a single agency as soon as possible and so we need to integrate those systems now. Develop those corporate policies and procedures, administration, financial management, human resource management, and you heard today how there's already looking at an HR transition plan in that regard. And of course, resource mobilization, communications liaison with, with partners, um, and most importantly, I would like to stress uh, performance management, evaluation, and reporting systems. You need to be able to sustain your organization. You have to tell your story, and your story is the impact that you're having with your target populations. And one of the ways you can do that is through strong performance management systems, looking at um, something that I borrowed from the Government of Canada, when its evaluation principles are 
relevance, economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. And if you can address those questions, then you're doing a good story about, you're doing a good job at being able to tell your story. Organizational sustainability. It's the ability of the organization to secure and manage sufficient resources to enable it to fulfill its mission effectively and consistently over time without excessive dependence on any single funding source. That's what we mean by organizational sustainability. And I think you'll see diversified funding base is pretty typical strategy employed by any organization that is looking at raising money to diversify your funding base in there um, in order to be a more sustainable. I think sustainability of services is where many people, th that's the real core of sustainability. It's the impact that you have has a long lasting impact after you're gone. That's what we mean by sustainability of services. That what you're doing has resulted in a change of behavior or a change of environment that has long lasting repercussions and produces the outcomes that you're looking for. That's really what we mean by that. So there'll be a strong focus here on maintaining and improving the provision, quality, and impact of your services. And financial sustainability, nuts and bolts, net income, liquidity, solvency. That you have enough cash on hand to address your needs, uh, liquidity, net income, that you have more revenue than you do expenses, and solvency, your, your assets and debt ratios. So in summary, sustainability is a process, it's not an end. It's something that always requires effort. It will involve all the elements and functions of an organization. They sort of have to be taken within the context of sustainability of that organization, your sustainability strategy or philosophy. CARFA's sustainability is not equated just with its financial strength. Financial sustainability alone is insufficient over time. You need to be looking at your services. You need to be looking at your organizational sustainability. In general, Carfin needs to develop its overall capacities of good management and technical capacity to generate revenue and or attract donor funding. So that is the conceptual framework that we'll be working on over the next uh, two or three months. I, mu I must say we've only recently got uh, initiated on this process. Um, and I believe by the end of September, we're to produce the final product. I would also very much welcome any input, especially from uh, the funding partners here, any ideas, any literature that you're aware of on sustainability, and if you could share that with us, that'd be, uh, we'd be very grateful. We don't pretend to uh, have all the answers here, and it is a field that is always evolving, so we'd be very interested in, in receiving that from you. Now, a quick snapshot about where we are, and uh, once again, picking up on a little bit from Dr. Walcott's presentation. Um, when we g we're moving down the road, and TDV was uh, contracted uh, about a year, two years ago, I guess, to do the, uh, the costing options report and develop the implementation plan. So we, we did that work, and uh, I guess this is the payback now, because it's sort of like, well, if that's how much it costs, show me the money. Now we have to develop the resource mobilization plan. But at that time we thought in order to implement this, you need a strategy, you need a plan, you need a fully dedicated team, and you need the funding. Well, we have the strategy, and we have the implementation plan. We know it's costed, there's 70 activities identified, there's a timelines, etc. We do not yet have the implementation or the full implementation team. We have an interim arrangement, and we do not yet have the, the, the required funding. Sorry, just one moment. So the roadmap was uh, implement plan developed mapping out how to move from five RHIs to a single agency model. There were 70 distinct activities identified in the areas of governance, people, process, technology, facility, and resource mobilization. That's the way we uh, structured the implementation plan. The cost was estimated at four million over four years above the normal operating costs of CARFA and the RHIs. 
and above any capital costs. So just to implement CARFA, it was estimated that it would require $4 million over the four years. Why are we doing this? Uh, once again, picking up on Dr. Walcott's presentation a little bit, um, there are efficiencies to be had, obviously, when you move from five organizations to one. Uh, PAHO did a study in 2007 on a comparative cost effectiveness study, and it was looking at at least a 10% reduction in administrative costs, which leads to a net savings of about 260000 per annum, uh, which is to be achieved by combining the five RHIs. Administrative cost savings would be realized, so you're not running five boards, five, five advisory committees, five facilities, etc. So obviously you would realize some cost savings and efficiencies there. I would like to say, though, that cost savings is a funny word to be using. Um, CARFA is designed to do more than what the Caribbean has now. It is to be more than what the five RHIs are providing. There is additional functionality designed into CARFA, and it is designed to deliver those at a world-class level, international standards. It is not possible to do more with less. That is not reality. So at the end of the day, there is a price tag, and we will get to that. Um, since we did our cost report and presented that in March 2010, there have been some new developments. So just a quick summary. In our costing report, we developed three scenarios. And the, and the one full-service model, which was agreed to to be pursued, it had an operating budget of around $13 million per annum, $13 million U.S. per annum. But there have been some developments since then. We also costed a facility at about, I think, 52 or $53 million. So we were asked to a standalone facility, lab, office for CARFA. And our calculation said well, about 213 people would be required to operate um, and, and fulfill all the functions for $13 million a year. There have been some changes since then. So there's been about a 25, we expect a 25% reduction in that staffing number. So not 213, but probably down to an area of around 160, 170 people uh, at a maximum. And some of that is due to looking at existing laboratory capacity at the national level, which has changed and been developed over the last few years. So Suriname is a good example, but also Guyana and Trinidad is looking at its national public health laboratory, Barbados, etc. And so what functionality is really required for CARFA uh, in terms of laboratory services has been uh, reduced and with a resulting reduction in some of the staffing, trying to keep the organization as flat as possible so that there is uh, less hierarchy um, involved and has resulted in some of these staffing changes possible, cost sharing uh, with uh, the Ministry of Health in Trinidad and Tobago on, on uh, some personnel, shared personnel services, et cetera. So what would be the benefits of CARFA? Once again, um, not to be repetitive, but it's important that we keep uh, these things in mind. One, you would have fully integrated programs. Right now you have five organizations operating independently. You would, uh, all those programs would be operating under one management structure, so fully integrated programs. Obviously, streamlined governance and administration. I already touched on that. They can produce some cost savings. Coordinated resource mobilization and use of funding. That's good news for some people in this room. So you don't have five people coming to you. You're just going to have one now. Uh, ease of an administration. So for member states, uh, that's five quota contributions that have to be provided annually to these organizations. So that will be consolidated um, uh, into one. And enhance public health impact is an expected result, and I just want to remind people a little bit about that. This slide presents um, some of the costs that have been involved with disease outbreaks over the last few years, and you can see there's tremendous uh, damage that can be done socioeconomically, health-wise, of course, 
by um, any of these diseases. SARS worldwide was estimated to have cost between 40 and 50 billion dollars. Uh, Avian flu, 25 to 30 billion. Foot and mouth in the UK, 18 billion. So all significant impacts. Um, Dr. Walcott had already mentioned the, uh, the cost of diabetes to the five governments in the Caribbean is estimated at one billion per annum. But as you can see by this table, if you can see that table, is the disease of non, uh, the prevalence of non-communicable disease is quite high, hypertension, arthritis, high cholesterol, vascular disease, etc. Uh, this was coming from a report on by the Caribbean Commission on Health and Development in 2005. There's also been sectoral analysis estimating the health and economic impact of disease and disease risks on the tourism is industry. We already heard about how the 13 inc incidents um, between 2000 and 2006 had cost the tourism industry about $250 million. And now we get to the resource requirements. So that's where we've been, what we're trying to do with the sustainability plan, and this is really the bottom line. And this is still based on the costing reports that we produced uh, a year and a half ago. So looking at a gradual increasing into CARFA, we're looking at uh, 2012 to 20. We did a five-year projection because it's be better planning five years. Um, co-location would happen in 2014, that's a, that's a plan right now. And this is uh, operating costs and implementation costs. So you can see a budget that starts around $8 million and would peak around $11 million in 2016. That would be a maximum. So for the five years, that's about a $50 million resource requirement. There is the additional cost of the implementation cost at about, four, well, not about $4 million. So the total resource requirements are around $54 million. We, mobilization needs, all that we have right now secured, obviously, are the member state quota contributions. And there's been an agreement that those, given the economic, the global economic situation, there's been an agreement that those would be held static for the next few years, that the member states would not be asked to uh, finance anything more. And that comes to just under $4 million a year. So member states' contributions to the five RHIs, when pooled, comes out to $4 million, and is expected that would continue for CARFA. So if we take that into consideration, uh, quota contributions over that same five-year period amount to just under $20 million. So resource mobilization needs are now at $34 million. And that's the gap. That's what we have to, uh, that's what we really have to be looking at uh, in a resource mobilization and sustainability plan. Um, there are opportunities out there for CARFA. You have to understand the RHIs have a very rich history of raising money. Even now, when we were looking at it, only 50% of the RHIs, when, when it was all pooled, only 50% of the RHIs' budgets were from quota contributions. They were already fundraising 50% of their costs. At times, that has been way higher. It's been much higher in some cases. So there's a rich history there and relationships that the RHIs have with their donor partners that uh, we would hope could be uh, maintained upon the establishment of CARFA. So, but we won't just be looking at that. So there's traditional donors, and we're looking at different sources of funding. Obviously, $34 million is a big price tag over five years. It's a, it's a daunting challenge. Um, but there are traditional donors. There's the bilaterals, the CETAs, USAIDs, the NORADs, the EUs, um, IFIs, international financial institutions. So we've been in discussions with the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, uh, multilateral organizations, the UN, um, the UN group, 
and of course private foundations like Ford, Carter, Bill and Melinda, etc. We'll also be looking at cost recovery. So there may be a case, and we'll, we'll obviously have to be careful about that, um, but there may be a case that CARFA will have to charge for services uh, supplied and we're going to be looking into that and trying to sketch out a cost recovery policy for the agency. Corporate social responsibility is another possible source of funding. Uh, we'd be looking specifically probably at the financial sector in the Caribbean, uh, tourism sector, etc. National public health agencies, the CDCs, the, the Public Health Agency of Canada, the, the uh, Department of Health in the UK, all have shown great support to uh, CARFA, um, the whole CARFA process up till now, and we certainly expect that to continue in the future. There's obviously a very special relationship with PAHO and the WHO uh, and when it comes to uh, CARFA, and we would expect that relationship to continue. And we've also been asked to investigate the options around a trust fund. Uh, the Caribbean has two examples existing right now, um, the Caribbean Court of Justice Trust Fund and the Climate Change Trust Fund. Uh, we've already had some meetings with those people just to see how they, the process they went through to establish those funds and whatnot and uh, how they're managed, etc. So we'll, we'll also be investigating that as a possible option. But reality would say it's going to be a mix of all these things that will uh, make CARFA sustainable over the long term. And if I'm not mistaken, the final slide would be uh, just to summarize um, what the figures I presented here uh, have not included the capital costs for the facility itself. That's under discussion between CARICOM, uh, the CARFA team, and the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, between now and co-location in 2014, so a three-year window, we're looking at a funding gap of approximately $20 million until 2014, and it's, like I said, 34 over the five years. Uh, PAHO will be approached for continued support at its CARIC and CFNI levels of approximately $2 million in operational cost per annum. Um, that would be up to the Council of Ministers, I believe, to, uh, to approach PAHO and its Caribbean program. On, on, on that allocation. Uh, and the EU funding is expected to be finalized uh, in early, uh, late 2011, early 2012. That's uh, about a US $2 million proposal um, coming in for the implementation plan. So what's urgent? The implementation plan is urgent. That's very urgent. Um, if we have, $2 million secured EU funding, that still leaves a $2 million gap on the implementation plan. I would say that's probably one of the most urgent requirements that we have at the moment. There's obviously, in 2012, uh, at $8 million, I think it was $8.3 million budget for 2012, there would be, assuming successful negotiation with PAHO around what is now CARIC and CFNI uh, uh, financial support, we'd have about a $2.3 million gap for 2012 on operating costs. So those are the most urgent uh, issues that we have. Uh, some of the next steps, September 2011, Resource Mobilization and Sustainability Plan is completed. October 2011, Strategies for Filling the Resource Gap for Sustainability Framework for the Post-2014 Review and uh, Decisions. Um, and then March 2012, um, once again, assuming the implementation team is in place, we would have a business plan completed for CARFA. Kind of hard to do that right now, but as soon as we have an implementation team in place, we would be moving towards a more complete business plan for the organization. Um, that's it for my presentation. Uh, I'd just like to thank the CARICOM Secretariat and the CARFA Project Management Team for the opportunity to work on this. Uh, I, I was mentioning to somebody at, during coffee break as a consultant, there's a lot of work you do and it's a bit dry, but this is a treat to work on something uh, as bold uh, initiative as CARFA is and something that could potentially be so historic. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Any, any questions or comments? I think we'll have a... Sorry, yes, uh, Paul. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sir George. J just to say, um, I mean, I agree with you about the diversity, diversifying the funding sources, and uh, I noted with interest what you said about corporate social responsibility. And I just think it's very important to, you know, make sure the reputation and the integrity of the uh, of CARFA isn't impugned in any way. Mm. So it's very important to have public interest criteria because you may be tempted to take money from, say, some of the consumption industries and things like that. So yeah. okay. I think it's very important to uh, protect yourself against that. Okay. Thank you. Good point. Any other? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, just curious around your, you know, moving forward, the approach you're going to take to develop, flesh out this mobilization um, strategy for the fall. How will you engage partners and stakeholders? Good question, <laughs> but uh, we, we've had uh, we've been engaged for about two weeks now. But we've already had some uh, consultations, meetings with uh, with partners, and obviously working closely with Dr. Green. Um, would you like to maybe also address that, Dr. Green? Well, I was just going to say that um, the presentation that follows will deal with that aspect. Mm -hmm. from the various partners, so if not, and I'm going to show that some of the points you raised will be discussed later on. Uh, so I'm going to suggest we move on to Dr. Green's presentation, and if his presentation doesn't answer your question, then you can raise it again, Dr. Green. Good morning, all. Chairman, um, distinguished members of the head table, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was tasked with the responsibility of uh, speaking to the ex accelerated implementation of CAFA, obviously with the support of partners. And the presentation will focus on the uh, strategic direction so that we have a notion of why we are accelerating implementation and towards what. Uh, it will deal with uh, the major areas um, requiring um, focus. Uh, we will deal with some of the new funding sources to fill the implementation gap mentioned in the previous presentation. And we will also try to deal with that question that was asked by the DG of um, Public Health of Canada, the strategies for advocacy and um, sustainability. And finally, I would like to deal with partner support. Um, it's important for me to uh, point you in the direction of a process uh, which um, we have been uh, reiterating this morning in the various um, major remarks and in the presentations that preceded. But let me suggest that if we were to deal with a process towards accelerated implementation, what we need is to be grounded in, the, um, in a planning foundation. And you could see from the mission and so on, the baseline costing and so on, that we have already done that. So we, we know where we are now. But we also um, have established future expectations, um, which have to do with the vision, values, and strategic priorities. And um, Dr. Walcott, in his presentation, dealt with those. Now, the strategy which would form the basis for an accelerated uh, implementation program um, has been s sort of elaborated from by, um, by TDV, by Brian uh, McKay. And he indicated to you that although that strategy has not been complete, we have a notion of the framework and the outline and where we are heading. Um, now, it's very important then when we are looking at the accelerated implementation to note that implementation is part of that process 
But it doesn't end with implementation. It, we also have to carry it through to the results management, and that will come in the other phase. But in the meantime, what we see uh, and know about an accelerated implementation um, plan is that it requires a dedicated strategy of engagement of various stakeholders, and it is also integrated to the resource mobilization and sustainability activity. So this is where we are now, trying to establish that framework for, um, for moving forward. Now, what has happened after we um, dealt with the, the strategies and so on was to try and identify if we were accelerating implementation with a view to mobilize resources, what are those major activity clusters that we will focus on. And right there in, on, the, on the screen, um, for those of you who are dealing with webcasting will not see the screen, but what is very important is that you would see that uh, those activity clusters deal with laboratory and um, substance uh, and with um, and surveillance networking arrangements, and that is really the core of, of CAFA. It also deals with the issues of um, manage, integrated management um, systems as well as dealing with um, the transition activities. And another cluster would be dealing with the issues that are perhaps of great importance to Trinidad and Tobago as enunciated by the minister this morning. That is complementing Trinidad's contribution to the capital costs of CARFA. Trinidad has given certain guarantees about CARIC, but there might be additionalities, and that is the complementary aspect of this cluster. And then the other cluster of research and development to which I think Prime Minister um, Douglas so ably um, spoke, in which research and development becomes a very critical component. Uh, we have a focal point in the Caribbean Health Research Council, um, but a cluster there is very important because not only does it deal with research and development, but with public health leadership. Um, and then finally, I think, uh, and not least, however, is the social marketing cluster, uh, where you, you reach out and, and embrace stakeholders, and also you, you try to understand the needs of, of the people and responding to the needs in the context of social marketing. Thanks. Now, this would provide an illustration of what one of the clusters would look like, um, the cluster that you deal with on a laboratory. And it provides an imagery here of CAFO being um, the, the, um, the, spoke, the hub uh, of a network in which countries country systems are integrated, but also the connectivity within the international systems. And I think when Brian spoke about the new um, modalities um, that have um, been involving and engaging the steering queen, this is one that whereas we started off with thinking of a grand CAFA laboratory, we now reconceptualize this thing in terms of a, CAFA being a net the net of a, a hub of a network and, and giving you a configuration of partnerships in moving forward this particular cluster. Well, the same in a modified way could be represented in all the other five major clusters that I have um, identified previously. Now, this brings us then to the challenge for the accelerated implementation leading to mobilization. And here I try to summarize what um, Brian posed in the, the slide um, that he gave on the, the nature of the resource gap. And one would see a resource gap if you take just bare bones contributions by governments, this would be the resource gap, which we have to struggle as a resource mobilization enterprise to fill. But he did indicate to you uh, some optimisms of what exists 
uh, in the context of, of drawing those resources and, and, and meaning that we have certain guarantees that we already have contributions, like for example, PAHO's persistence um, and maintaining its contribution to the public health enterprise in the region is one. Thanks. Now, having said that, it is important to note that in the context of the steering committee and the activities that have been entrained by the Caribbean community and PAHO over the period, um, that, that resources have been mobilized. And I just identify um, the resources in this period, 2008 to 2011, which is the reason why we could move from the conceptualization to where we are today at this partners meeting. The CARICOM Secretariat, for example, um, has contributed uh, five, approximately $500,000. And this is really mostly in kind, the services that it has put and made available to the exercise over the period. PAHO has contributed um, $500,000 up to the end of 2010. So when we look at what it has contributed in 2011, the first six months, it will even be more. And then we have perhaps um, two partners that have really helped to maintain the momentum of, um, of, of this enterprise. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, in two tranches, have provided assistance to us uh, in the sum of a approximately 800,000 Canadian dollars. And that has helped tremendously in running the management, in moving the management of CARFA, that process onward. Public Health uh, of uh, the UK Public Health, uh, Department of Public Health has provided assistance for a variety of things, um, in particular sustaining social marketing enterprises um, in the sum of approximately $225,000. And the Carrigum community, that is the member states, um, they have not been silent. When we look and we estimated the in-kind contribution from the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and the other countries in the region, they estimated approximately 500,000 over this period. So this accounts for the fact that we could um, move this mechanism forward with over this period, a, a total working um, capital of about 2.5 million. Next. Now, I wanted to give you an idea of what uh, Dr. Walcott referred to. We have been very vigilant in the steering committee in trying to stimulate and to, um, to stimulate and to move our, our, um, our grant process forward. Uh, and we um, have submitted several, um, several um, proposals to agencies since uh, January. We have been successful um, with the Public Health Agency of Canada. We have not been successful with the IDB public, um, public Good Grant, but the optimistic thing is that the IDB has requested us to resubmit uh, with its guidance, um, and indeed there will be an an allocated mentor in IDB for the re-submission um, of a proposal in this period, uh, in the period which begins in September. Then there is JICA, the Japanese. We had completed a proposal um, to deal with the implementation process, which was going through the process in the week of March the 13th. Needless to say, what happened in Japan in the, the week of March the 13th, and therefore that now proposal uh, and the partnership with Japan is, is in abeyance. Now, there are other activities which I want to bring to your attention. The European Union, we have already referred to this. It's uh, um, uh, support, institutional strengthening support for uh, 1.6 million euros. Um, a human resource transition and social marketing proposal to the UK, um, the Department of Health, for approximately um, 70,000 um, pounds, and the CDB, a proposal for 99,000. Now, these are just things that we have done in this period, but they are things that we hope to now escalate in the period after the partnership meeting. 
Um, one is a proposal, and this is really for moving the, the process forward. Um, one is a, a proposal for the implementation of the human resource development plan. In the transition phase, much needs to be done. This is an area of approximately 450,000. Uh, there is also the development of the business plan that um, uh, Brian referred to uh, of approximately 150,000. And then there is the establishment of a trust fund, the need for a very firm set of feasibility options as to how and how best this could work for the sustainability of CAFA. We estimate that work to cost in the vicinity of 150,000. Then there are specific foundation activities for CAFA sustainability uh, in line with the main clusters. Um, and what I have here are really what you can call, it's a pity I didn't think of it before, but I could have put a tree on this and you would have had branches and these would have been categorized as the low hanging fruit. And therefore, this is something that we will work on immediately after this meeting in trying to encourage partners, dialogue with partners, uh, to try to support some of these important elements um, which we call low-hanging fruits. Support for establishing critical um, ICT elements for the CARFA, the CARFA services and outreach program. Very important. Uh, creating the standards for public health elements of the hotel and tourism industry. In fact, if the Caribbean Tourism Organization were here uh, this morning, they would have spoken to their willingness to partner with us in this, in this particular element. Then there are linkages between CAFA and the institutions of higher learning, so important as, as Dr. Walcott in responding to the question that was asked, the very first question, the university is becoming very important, but not only the universities, the research agencies in the Caribbean and elsewhere. And then we have the research and development activities to which I've already referred. And they, they could be small things, dealing with issues related to public health concerns, which we could probably work with CDC or with uh, USAID or with any of the agencies or work under the guise of the, the, um, the Global Health Initiative, which is now touted as one of the new mechanisms for approaches to U.S to U.S.'s priorities in health and development. And of course, I think that we have to continuously, as that first question, um, root our capacity building in training programs for public health leadership. So these are what we call some of the low-hanging fruit, and the steering committee and the groups will work assiduously in this period starting, um, uh, starting from tomorrow um, to deal with some of these things. Now, this brings me penultimately to advocacy. If we were to accelerate implementation for resource mobilization, then we have also to have strong advocacy and also to engage partners. And we have already begun to do so with our engagement of the CARICOM ambassadors to the OAS. Uh, we have uh, the dean with us, and we have the incoming chair with us um, from Guyana and from St. Kitts, uh, Nevis, respectively. Now, we also have engaged the CARICOM ambassadors in Brussels as a way of, of moving the process uh, forward and needling the European Union. Um, we also have engaged the permanent representatives of the UN. Um, only last week, Dr. Um, Dr. Um, Rudy Cummins and, and Ms. Bernard had a, a very engaging discussion with the UN rep permanent representatives. That was on the NCDs and the negotiations to take place. And then we have the Washington, Cap Washington community, very, very critical, and indeed Capitol Hill. And here, Dr. Rosas from PAHO has put at our disposal the PAHO lobbyists to help us to advocate uh, in that constituency. And finally, we have the social marketing targeted to stakeholders. This has come up over and over again. And without the engagement of the stakeholders, looking at their needs and their responses, I don't think that we could move CAFA 
um, in an accelerated implementation mode. So these are the strategies underlying advocacy which we have begun and which we also have to accelerate. Thanks. So finally, how do we expect the partners to relate to all of this? We expect the partners to join the resource mobilization group. We expect that. We expect the partners to contribute to one or more of the cluster activities or the priorities that the low-hanging fruit. And we expect the partners to do what the chairman said at the beginning, to engage and to continue to engage. But more specifically, I think, we expect what Dr. Walcott said. I want to reinforce, because this is the thing, we expect our partners to be champions for CAFA. If these happen, I think we are on a good roll towards the accelerated implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Green. Any questions for Dr. Green? I, I expect uh, that some of the questions are going to be woven. Yes. So, any questions for Dr. Green? If there are no questions for Dr. Green, I suspect, Eddie, that some of the questions are going to be woven into the next session on partners' intervention. And I think you'll have the, the opportunity of commenting on some of the interventions that are going to be uh, uh, made. May I suggest that we move into that part of the meeting, partners' interventions? And I know that some of our partners have already indicated that uh, they would wish to speak to this issue. Uh, I don't, would you object if I call the partners by name and ask them to comment? I hope that's not sort of fingering you or as uh, the, my good book would say, as St. Paul said to uh, Timothy, laying hands on you lightly. Uh, shall we start with the Public Health Agency of Canada? As the new kid on the block, you want me to start first? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, first let me start by saying that I am delighted to, um, to be the new uh, member of the steering committee for um, the Public Health Agency of Canada. My predecessor, James Gilbert, who many of you um, know quite well, um, was quite committed to the success of CARFA. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to, um, to take the baton from James and to carry the work forward. And uh, on behalf of the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, and on behalf of Renu, who's been, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, you know, really our, our, our constant link to the, to the initiative, um, uh, say that I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I think that um, we, uh, there's much work has gone on that is very clear. Uh, and so I think that in terms of the vision, uh, this need to continue to champion uh, and to engage uh, is vital for the success of, of CARFA. Uh, of course, whenever you get into the conversation around money, no matter where you are, that's always a little more sobering. Um, and certainly the, the last set of presentations have been a, 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 a bit of a reality check. Um, but we have to forge ahead. We have to continue to find some solutions. And uh, we certainly look forward to uh, a more fleshed out resource mobilization strategy uh, and to see perhaps a, uh, a more fleshed out stakeholder engagement strategy to get a sense of how, uh, how you're going to cast your net to capture uh, more interested parties um, to help support uh, CARFA and to see that vision come to, to, uh, to reality. Um, I think that uh, we're buoyed by certainly the ongoing commitment by PAHO, uh, by, uh, by CARICOM and uh, Caribbean states and other like-minded uh, countries who, uh, who are expressing their, their support for, for CARFA. Um, uh, so so that, those are just overall my, my, my comments, my impressions uh, so far. Uh, from a practical perspective, I do have a question that I'd like to ask in regards to um, what I see as the, the work going on currently around resource mobilization and, and moving some of the strategies forward 
the money coming from the EU for the implementation team and that gap there. And so perhaps this is an off, offside conversation, but uh, I'm not clear in terms of, of between now and then when the implementation team comes into to place with the IGA being formally signed in July, what's going to happen there? Because I think the one message we've heard clearly is around momentum and, and not wanting to lose momentum. And so that I'll use the word gap. I don't mean to sound so negative. I'm not sure there is a gap. I just am not clear in my own mind what happens between now and then. And I think as a, as a, as a partner, uh, it, would, it would be nice to just know what the strategy is for that, for that period of time. I will end there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wanted to call out? Thank you for the opportunity to comment. And, uh, Thank you, top table, ministers, ambassadors, and colleagues. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Health Action Partnership International, which focuses on um, tackling health inequalities and addressing the social terms of health uh, globally, working closely with Michael Marmot and his team, and also on behalf of the National Heart Forum, uh, with a particular focus around non-communicable diseases, um, both in the UK and globally. Today I'm speaking actually on behalf of the Department of Health for England. Um, Eddie's already mentioned that we've provided considerable support uh, through a number of missions, through part funding for uh, Nicola, Nicola O'Reilly, and I do say many thanks for all that she's contributed, um, and also helping to map some of the partners and stakeholders. So we, we, we've, we've got a long engagement. Uh, and it, and it's really pleasing to see where we're at. I think that sense of momentum is beginning to come together. So I was very pleased to hear about the probable, in fact, I'd say almost certain intergovernmental agreement signing in July, about the EC funding coming through, about the appointment of the executive director and the executive board and that transition team. I think when we have those things in, when you have those things in place, uh, <coughs> it'll be much easier to move forward with a, a, a real CARFA, which can provide that coordination function that's so necessary, do those things that are too expensive or too specific for individual member countries to take forward, and provide those economies of scale which you've talked about. Um, the Department of Health, as Eddie Green has said, has indicated a willingness through HAPI to fund technical assistance in managing part of that change process. Um, and for better and for worse, the UK has quite a lot of experience in managing change processes. So uh, I think we have much we contribute both, to, both in learning what works and what, what doesn't work. Um, so we'd aim to identify with Jerome, Eddie and others uh, the support which would be most helpful to manage that process, the overall integration, the change management, management issues, and how you manage the relationships both internally and externally through that state of flux. Uh, we've also, and I indicated earlier on, uh, the Health Protection Agency has made a, a very clear offer to be part of that advisory board uh, on developing the lab facilities and thinking about how you integrate labs from around the Caribbean uh, and provide that information flow. So the, the key flag in there is to make sure that um, the request for, for assistance of that kind, and that's what I'm calling technical assistance, uh, is, is made in good time. So we're really looking forward to the next three years. Uh, I, personally, I'd like to see s uh, more discussion around the health inequalities and social determinants of health agenda, uh, and we, look f we see this as a, as a collaboration. I may have further comments to make later, but that feels like a, a, good, a good starting point. Uh, Thank you, Sir George. Uh, I think with this distinguished uh, head table that we have before us and the, and the uh, broad participation we have in the room, we're, we're off to uh, a very good start, and I'm very, very pleased to see that. Um, I, I think although we're in the initial stages, the streamlining of the region's health activities uh, through the creation of the Caribbean Public Health Agency uh, is certainly going to facilitate leveraging of key resources and give the Caribbean community and CARICOM the ability to quickly respond uh, to outbreaks of diseases, emergencies, and disasters that threaten the well-being and the health of the residents and of visitors within the CARICOM region and beyond. 
Uh, and I think uh, the work that CARICOM has done most recently to uh, have the uh, special high-level meeting at the UN this coming September is going to be uh, a really another another way to to mark that leadership that's uh, that's being demonstrated in the Caribbean. And so I, I congratulate you on that and, and look forward to uh, being able to assist you. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with PAHEF, uh, we have a f over a 40-year history of working with the Pan American Health Organization. We're, we were actually created by the Pan American Health Organization originally to work as its partner in the private sector, and we continue to do that. Um, and our ability to focus uh, our uh, efforts uh, on private, the private sector, both the not-for-profit not and the for-profit sector, are the areas that, uh, of expertise that we can bring to assist uh, CARFA as it moves forward in its resource mobilization and its activities that is going to be carried out. So I think, you know, based on these goals and benefits, PAHEF, uh, the Pan American Health and Education Foundation, we see a great opportunity for the partnership and collaboration uh, as this new regional <coughs> public health agency moves forward. And we are uh, committed to working with you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Cedar, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to chime in. Uh, my name is Darren Rogers. I'm the CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency representative based at the Canadian Mission to the OAS here in Washington. Um, <clears throat> I was here last year, as a lot of you were, and I think it's uh, it's been educational and encouraging to see um, the work that's uh, been put into making CARFA a reality over the last year. Um, and I agree with other uh, interveners who have recognized, I think, the momentum uh, that's behind this initiative. Um, for me, one of the most interesting developments um, in listening to the presentations today is the the refining and the making explicit of linkages um, between the work that CARFA um, will be doing in the area of public health and the impact that that will have on economic opportunities and growth in the region. Um, when you talk about the health of the people in a healthy workforce, reducing the economic burden of care on the state for people who are ill, um, and the impacts, the positive impacts that uh, a healthy country and region have on tourism, um, hotels, small business in the region. I think these are all <coughs> really important linkages to make and I think could be very persuasive elements um, to integrate into CARFA's resource mobilization strategy. So that, that's been very encouraging to see. Um, CETA has been closely following CARFA from its early origins to where it is now, um, and we'll continue to follow uh, the developments there, working in close coordination and collaboration with our Government of Canada partners, including the Public Health Agency of Canada and others. Um, so thank you, and we look forward to continuing the discussion. Much indeed. Ms. Godina from the World Bank. Thank you, Sir George, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this meeting. Uh, we are very pleased to be here. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to uh, host a meeting with Dr. Green and some power representatives at the bank, uh, in which we started discussing uh, opportunities for cooperation in this area. Uh, today's meeting allowed us to understand better uh, what is the financial gap uh, and uh, uh, what are the institutional arrangements for CARFA. Uh, we um, are very willing to continue our discussions with uh, CARICOM and with PAO to see what is the assistance that the bank can provide to this very important public health initiative. Uh, there are two areas in which we think that uh, we may have a role and, uh, and that we think are important. One is to show the potential efficiency gains that come from uh, CARFA. And the other is to have a clear uh, strategy for the sustainability of this institution. 
So we will uh, be very glad to continue working with Dr. Green and his team to explore the possibilities of the bank assisting uh, CARFA, especially in these two areas. Uh, thank you very much again for the invite. Thank you very much. Let's continue the, the support to the bank in terms of health programs in the Caribbean has been legendary, and uh, we look forward to the continuation of that uh, uh, support. You've been very generous in offering to continue our discussions. Now, Dr. Scott Rassan from Johnson & Johnson. There is Scott. There is Scott. Thank you, Sir George and Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, and uh, everyone here. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'm Vice President of Global Health at Johnson & Johnson. My name is Scott Ratson, and I'm also Editor Journal of Health Communication based here at George Washington University. And I would just like to first say, as a public health physician with an emphasis in communication, I'd like to congratulate all of you uh, for the fine work uh, that's done thus far, and it's quite impressive to see the idea of a Caribbean public health agency uh, come to fruition at this juncture, and hopefully will continue on the global scale. Uh, I'd like to just mention a few areas that I think have incredible promise, uh, notwithstanding a presentation that Dr. Green made at United Nations in New York a couple of weeks ago on the idea of a report card. Uh, there have been other discussions globally, uh, not only with the UN and PAHO and so forth, on health literacy. And uh, I currently represent industry on the non-communicable disease discussion. And we've looked at similar ideas of what's called a scorecard or a report card of indicators that might help make a difference of how we can measure uh, both individual progress on risk factors as well as global progress of, of system avail abilities in, in public health. And I say that because I, I look at two Canadian colleagues, if I may say, uh, as a North American here, uh, that a couple weeks ago in Shanghai, Alberta was presenting work that they've done on a report card on physical activity that since has been uh, uh, followed in Kenya and in other countries. Uh, again, last week, Dr. Green's work, and, and just on Friday, I presented some ideas at both the UN uh, on digital health, which was chaired by Dominica, and later in the day, uh, had some discussion at Council of Formulations on this idea uh, with US CDC, Institute of Medicine, and others. And it seems to me that there's a great opportunity at this juncture to help develop a level of indicators, not a thousand indicators or 400 indicators, but five to ten indicators uh, that might help make a difference of where we can move on non-communicable disease. I say that principally at this juncture, and it's, it's not without um, having worked with Dr. Rosas at uh, the Global Agenda Council on Chronic Disease with the World Economic Forum, that other groups have come up with this, this idea. So it's not as if it's uh, on a platter, but I think it's an opportunity which time is ripe, and if CARPA could take that on on an individual basis uh, of, of developing risk factors uh, that have actionable activities that are not just social marketing but true communication and campaign-oriented, as well as the policies that are in place with sustainable systems, I think it can make a huge difference not only in the region for your citizens, but also in the, in the region for PAHO and globally. So I would just like to put that on the record and then secondly mention two other areas, uh, one which is M Health or mobile health. There was a report last week by the ITU and World Health Organization which looked at different regions' abilities to uh, advance in mobile health. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that as Johnson & Johnson, we've uh, embarked on one with the United States government on text for baby here in the United States, and then just recently announced uh, with USAID a joint project on a mobile alliance for maternal action, uh, where we're um, working in partnership, at least at this juncture, for three other countries, uh, and looking to work on this globally. If you look at the report, at least I received last week, many of you might have seen other regions uh, or other pieces, it, it has a number of countries in the Americas that also speak to the promise of, of M Health, and I would suggest looking at that uh, on the potential of how this agency, not only for alerts, although SMS alerts are important, whether it's a SARS or food outbreak or something of that nature, but also on the positive side, on immunizations, on being able to build a sustainable system with communication. And then finally, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just mentioned sustainability. Uh, we believe that sustainability is key, and I, I really appreciate how you've looked at this. I say we in such a way that as a world's largest private uh, public company in terms of uh, health, 
we put sustainability goals out at our annual meeting in April. And amongst those sustainability goals, we have two health goals, one which is global health and access. Uh, last Friday or last Thursday uh, at the UN, we, we again upped our commitment to mother, preventing mother to child transmission for HIV. But secondly, we also have health literacy right in our goals for 200 uh, programs in 25 countries. And we believe that it's important enough to have sustainability, and particularly as look, hearing this region and hearing about the, um, the hotel and food groups that you mentioned, the engagement, I would strongly urge uh, to also engage different sectors in terms of looking at sustainability and how they may uh, also both benefit, support CARPA, but also uh, be engaged in both the design and development of the multi-sectoral approach that will make this successful. So thank you very much for the ability to participate today, and I'm happy if I, if I could help to take any of the ideas forward uh, in the future uh, via my different channels, as I'll be speaking on Thursday at the, at the UN on NCDs. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. This has been very, very uh, helpful indeed, and uh, in the development of the technical cooperation program of, of uh, CARFA, I'm sure many of the areas you mentioned will figure very prominently indeed. So. I'm sure as we develop the technical cooperation work plan and the goals of that plan, some of the things you mentioned will uh, certainly uh, surface as priorities for CARFA. Ambassador Bernal from the IDB. Thank you, Sir George. Good morning to all. My apologies for being late, but we have been following the proceedings, the alternate executive director for the Caribbean on the board of directors, Mr. Kirk Kisto, has been here. I have taken the floor not to try to add substantively to the discussion at this stage, but to do the following. First of all, to congratulate CARICOM for the idea of creating a Caribbean public health agency. We acknowledge the leadership of Prime Minister Denzel Douglas and the Acting Secretary General. We also recognize the work of Dr. Eddie Green. We think that this is a superb idea. It's urgently needed. We feel that it meets many of the objectives which the Inter-American Development Bank supports in the Caribbean region. First of all, it's a very important sector public health, one which we are very involved in. Secondly, it is a regional project. And thirdly, it's a regional project which seeks to rationalize the use of resources by combining a number of agencies and to bring a holistic approach at the institutional level to this issue. And we think this is very commendable. As you know, the bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, is involved conceptually, and we are in discussions. And we, in the Caribbean office at the level of Board of Directors, pledge our support for this project, and we'll do everything to ensure that the interest and intellectual support of the bank is converted into some more tangible support for its implementation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and I like the, uh, your peroration. Uh, Dr. Visser, Minister of Health and Sport and Wellbeing of Aruba. Dr. Visser. Thank you, Sir George. Um, I believe that the Netherlands, due to the new constituency in the Caribbean, um, and the Netherlands actually now forming part of the Caribbean uh, region, will have an, uh, an added engagement and interest in the region. The islands that uh, have the status that Aruba has, which are Curaçao and St. Martin, will also join together. And I believe that uh, we, in the position that we find ourselves now, can leverage the Netherlands to give extra support uh, to CARPA uh, in the sense uh, also uh, what we would, uh, I think, like to see is that CARPA uh, like the Caribbean, uh, started out uh, with a lot of fractured agencies that we're putting together. But we have to keep our eye on the ball, and that is quality, it is accessibility, and it's a delivery um, of the product, which is public health for our region. Public health is extremely important for our region because it gives us the compass, the compass to which our curative care 
can adjust itself towards. And I think especially being uh, part of the Caribbean, which is very fractured still, uh, the islands, we need to come together. We've seen this uh, just recently in the first um, Pan American Congress on obesity with special attention to childhood obesity, where uh, we championed the new Aruba Declaration, a uh, belief which you will all shortly have. Uh, 22 representatives signed this, including uh, Let's Move, uh, Obama Organization, um, and uh, CDC from the U.S., and the different constituents from Latin America and the Caribbean. We see that there is a huge need uh, for us to pull together, uh, to unify, and to have one central uh, area that really directs everything. But in that same uh, breath, I have to say that um, in the Caribbean, uh, the delivery time is also very critical. Uh, so that needs to be uh, uh, kept in, in sight. Uh, and furthermore, I fully support uh, CARPA uh, and uh, its vision. And I think that uh, together we can really champion this difference in the Caribbean with our own Caribbean people also heading this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Mr. Diaz, Dr. Diaz from Social and Scientific Systems Incorporated, wish to make a comment, please. It's better if you use the microphone. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Diaz. I work at Social and Scientific Systems, or SSS, in Silver Spring, Maryland. SSS is the secretariat for the 2011 Caribbean HIV Conference, which is scheduled to be held November 18th through the 21st in Nassau, Bahamas. Dr. Jacob Gale, our Director of Caribbean Program, sends his greetings to all and his regrets for not being able to be here himself. As you know, one of the greatest challenges that will confront CARFA when it comes fully operational will be the public health response to HIV across the second hardest hit region in the world. The 2011 Caribbean HIV Conference will convene special sessions for donors, funders, technical partners, and others to discuss their roles in sustaining the Caribbean HIV response. The U.S. National Institutes of Health Office of AIDS Research is a co-host of the conference, together with the Gover Government of the Bahamas and the University of Puerto Rico, and wishes to invite CARFA to consider continuing today's conversation at the NASA conference specifically as it relates to considering its anticipated leadership role in HIV AIDS control. We would like to offer conference space at no additional cost at the Atlantis Conference Center to hold such a session concurrently with the conference scientific sessions. Should you be willing to accept our invitation, we can discuss further details with you at your convenience. We welcome CARFA to join the list of official Caribbean regional partners for the conference and we invite you to review the printed information I have with me to, uh, to inform you further and of which I've placed copies in, in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Diaz, uh, for that very generous offer. I'm sure that the Secretariat, in conjunction with PANCAP, will be most uh, pleased to uh, have those further discussions. Are there any other interventions? If there are, yes, please. Uh, uh, C, C, Mr. George, C, C. Uh, I'm Kevin DeCock from, from mm. CDC, uh, US CDC. Um, I'm also new to this discussion, but I uh, just want to thank the Honorable Prime Minister and the Secretary General and the Regional Director for hosting this. Um, obviously, a very positive initiative with uh, a very logical initiative with potential great impact. The US, of course, is deeply committed to the health of the Caribbean and, and deeply engaged already. My own agency is extensively involved in um, particularly for HIV AIDS through our regional office in Barbados, our office in Guyana uh, and separate from this particular meeting of course we're deeply engaged uh, in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, actually talking of CARIC, um, some of our some eminent colleagues from CDC uh, were former directors of CARIC with, with great distinction uh, thinking of our former CDC director, Jeff Copeland, Dr. Steve Blount, uh, um, both of them. Um, 
In terms of what was asked of partners, uh, championship and engagement, certainly CDC is, is very pleased to do that, and we also can commit to offering uh, continued support in, in terms of technical assistance, including advice on laboratory issues. Um, we'd be very pleased to continue discussions about uh, HIV AIDS uh, through CARFA, perhaps focusing particularly on prevention of mother-to-child transmission, which such important commitments have been made to. Um, financial assistance for us is difficult. We're not a donor agency, and we also, actually at CDC, are being buffeted by the, the uh, adverse winds that are uh, blowing around us in, in this part of the world. Um, we have not, I certainly have not had any discussions with other parts of the U.S. government that CARFA, I think, should undertake with USAID, with other, um, with other partners. And finally, uh, it is, of course, uh, encouraging and, again, logical to see the emphasis that is being put proactively on non-communicable diseases, which are such a, an emerging issue. Um, many, of the, many of those issues can be addressed uh, through policy initiatives, which do not have to be expensive. Um, but at the same time, I think there is a real need to develop a public health approach to some of them that do need clinical management, and I'm thinking particularly of hypertension. Uh, I think a, a public health approach um, with standardized approach, cl uh, clinical management of hypertension in a region like, uh, in a you know, a finite region like the Caribbean could actually be extremely productive and show lessons for others. And I do just want to emphasize my support, our support, for the concept of targets and indicators and keeping uh, this discussion and the expectations of, of CARFA as, as tangible as possible. Thank you, Sir George. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, if not, I'm going to invite... Uh my colleagues here, Secretary General, Director, Minister, if they wish to make any additional comments. Ambassador, you wish to make any additional comments? No, Thank you. Dr. Rose, you wish to make any additional comments? Uh, I, I think that uh, what, uh, what we have heard is very encouraging, and I, and I want to, to thank uh, those who intervened. And um, I, I took very good note of the comments, and I think that being here in Washington and linked to many of, of the uh, people who are around this table, I, uh, we, we are ready to support through our uh, uh, area of, of partnership and PAHEF, uh, Dr. Green for the resource mobilization. Uh, and I also want to, to call the attention to several of the important milestones that are going to happen immediately after now, uh, like both Councils, you know, CFNI and CAREG, uh, the um, heads of government meeting, uh, and other opportunities like the high-level meeting in New York and then the, the, the HIV conference in November. I think that we have also to take uh, these opportunities for advocacy, for uh, reaching out, and for making, you know, more concrete uh, proposals uh, uh, move forward so that we can arrive at the end of the year with a glossy and... Uh, uh, very sunny face in the result mobilization for CAFA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rose. Is Prime Minister wish to make any comments? Yeah. Um, thank you, Sir George. I, I think the, the comment I'd like to make at this time is that my colleagues as heads of government would be very pleased um, for the interaction and responses that we've had from our partners here today. And what is going to be important to us is to maintain that momentum, which I believe we are again leaving this meeting um, with. There are some partners who I believe we can further engage as political leaders. Um, and I believe that from what I've heard here, um, and the absence of some of the countries, China, India, Brazil, Russia, these which are emerging in a particular way, 
I think that politically we can attempt to bring them on board. And what I've heard from you is really an encouragement for me to report back to heads for us to make that further political push to bring other partners on board. And so I want to thank you very, very much for this interactive session. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Dr. Green, do you wish to make any comment? I think that um, the, the one that I would like to um, refer to is what happens um, between now and the implementation team. There's a very important operational issue. Um, we, as I think Dr. Walcott would have said in his presentation, uh, experience a setback since we thought the implementation team would have been in place in, in April. Um, it seems now more than likely in, in January 2012. Now, what will happen between now, June the 13th, and then? First of all, um, we have put in place an interim implementation team. Notwithstanding the lack of, of support um, for an implementation team, as was said before, implementation activity continued. Dr. Walcott has to be highly complimented for anchoring that along with um, Nicola O'Reilly. And let us say two groups, one in CARICOM, what is called the CARICOM CAFA team, and another the CARICOM PAHO team. The latter is chaired in the absence of the director by the assistant director. Now, um, what then will happen after today is with the support, with your generous support, um, Director General of PHAC, um, what we have done is to align some of the resources from the grant to sustain an interim team to do almost those same functions that were outlined in the grant. And um, we have had a discussion with the Secretary General who is willing, and I believe before we leave, to expedite that process and to have that team in place by July. So between July and December, what we're working with is an interim implementation team. In the meantime, based on discussions with the PAHO director, PAHO will initiate um, an executive search, international executive search, for four of the top positions in the implementation team. The executive director, the finance officer, the, um, the human resource um, development um, person, and the social marketing. And, and that should happen in a timely manner as soon as possible so that as the funds are available for the implementation team, we would also be able to immediately elect. The third thing that would have to happen is an engagement with Trinidad and Tobago about the, um, the hosting of that implementation team because, uh, in fact, that is uh, the team that will make a lot of those decisions related not only to the um, implementation of the resource and sustainability plan, but, as I think Brian said, the establishment of the business plan in early 2012. So we do have a, a road map, and uh, as I said, that uh, despite some of the setbacks that we have had, we continue to work with resources in a way, uh, and sometimes with some creative imagination. But we want to thank the partners. We want to, in particular, thank PAHO for its, you know, his, its continued support. And it would be remiss of me, since I may not have the floor um, um, after this, to just say that he would recognize when I apologize for any abuse of his generosity. That is our chairman. I mean, I have an office next to him, and, and, and I go to him all the time. And this is one phenomenal human being, I can assure you, a champion for CAFA. And I want us to thank him very much for his engagement and support. Thank you very much. That was not in the program. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eddie. The program says that I make some summary and conclusions on the way forward. It would be bordering on the pathetic to try to summarize the presentations that were made. 
But if I could begin, uh, perhaps, with a, a bit of uh, personal reflection. I joined PAHO in 1982, and uh, in September of that year, 1982, the then director asked me to head a team to the Caribbean to look at the utilization of Caribbean resources in 1982. In 1982, we concluded, among other things, that the maintenance of the PAHO centers was absolutely crucial for uh, public health in the, Car in the Caribbean. And then in 1985, there was a movement for the disestablishment of, Ca of, PAHO, of, of CARIC as a PAHO center under the leadership of Philip Boyd, a process which I resisted fiercely because I thought the time was not ripe for the disestablishment of one center and not to seek a more a wider Caribbean approach uh, uh, to, to, the, to the issue. So I have more than a passing interest in the development of a ca collective Caribbean response to the Caribbean public health problems. And over the course of the years, the emergence of these problems and the similarity of these problems and the ability of the Caribbean people to deal with these problems when they put their heads together has convinced me even more of the legitimacy and necessity for AECAFA. So I really am committed uh, 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 to this process. And I was thrilled to death when uh, Dr. Roses wrote to the Secretary General advocating that the time was ripe to move forward with, the, with the, uh, Dr. Roses at that time, move forward with the creation of CARFA. Dr. Walker has said that the, it has been a, 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 a long process. As uh, Ryan said, when Jamaica was 25, the road was rocky and the hills were steep, but we will survive. Uh, the road has been a bit rocky, the hills have been a bit steep, but I think we can see uh, definitive progress over the course of these uh, 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 eight years. I'd like also to, to congratulate uh, our, our speakers. I was really quite cheered by the presentations of the Secretary General, Dr. Roses, and the eloquent feature address of the Prime Minister, which set out quite clearly their perception of the need for CAFA and the need, as I said, and the needs of, 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 of CAFA. But I, I, I'd like to emphasize a point that uh, has been made in the last three presentations and highlighted by Dr. Green in terms of the implementation and stressed by the Prime Minister in terms of the momentum. Uh, there is no doubt that it would be really great for our Prime Minister to go to his heads of government and say, not only is CAFA becoming a reality legally, but he can see evidence of what CAFA will do. So one of the things I would be happy to see in the interim implementation team is the beginning of a technical cooperation strategy for PAHO. Because process is fine, but we need to know what CAFA will do in order to improve the public health of the people of the Caribbean. And I'm so pleased to note that one of the things set out for the implementation team, the actual implementation team on the, as one of its early remits, is to have such a technical cooperation strategy. So I would hope that the interim implementation team will also take that on board and have a technical cooperation strategy so that we can communicate to the Caribbean people that CAFA does not only represent a collection of buildings or a collection of people in Trinidad and Tobago, but represents an agency, a locus, a focus for collective response to Caribbean, to Caribbean uh, 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 problems. I, I accept that uh, there are implementation gaps. And don't think I'm a, 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 a silly optimist when I point out there is no institution in the world that starts out with a history that is likely to last for years that has all the resources when it starts. None. I know of none. Not even Steve Jobs had all the resources necessary to start Apple. No. And we have, I had a boss who used to believe in the thesis of Salvatore Ambulando, it be worked out as we go along. I'm not saying, suggesting that, but I do suggest that, I don't know if you picked up clearly in Brian's presentation, that there are already resources being mobilized by the institutions that can be applied to this gap. He was quite clear about that. 
Also, he pointed out that the capacity of these institutions, by the nature of their work, have the capacity to mobilize resources which cannot be figured ab initio represent resources that will fill that implementation gap. And the third thing he pointed out, that his uh, presentation of resource needs is predicated on what CAFA should do ideally, not necessarily what is a minimum scenario for CAFA. So therefore, the implementation gap has to be some figure between what is the ideal a, 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 a work of CAHO and what, in fact, is the actual work of the, of the, of the institutions. Because one of the things that Dr. Rose has pointed out at the beginning, we are not thinking only of shoehorning five institutions into one agency. We are thinking of a new agency that will have a remit, will have opportunities, will have possibilities beyond what the current five institutions uh, uh, will have. So I would hope that this interim uh, 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 in, in, implementation team, when they put together what is the technical cooperation strategy, it will become much clearer. The figures that Brian is going to produce will become much clearer, and the steepness of the hills will not be as obvious or not be as great as, the, as, as they appear at, 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 at this stage. One of the issues that has come up very clearly, it always comes up when we speak of new institutions and when we speak of how they're going to go forward and what are the resources that are necessary for these institutions to, flourish, to function and to flourish. And essentially, uh, usually we fix on the financial resources, but we know jolly well it's not only financial resources that make an institution good, a good, a good one. There are the, not only the physical resources, and Dr. Green has spoken about those, there's the organizational resources, there are the informational resources, there are the political, res financial resources, yes, and the political resources. And I think the presence of the Prime Minister here is an earnest of the strength of the political resources that are behind the uh, formation and continuation of, 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 of CAFA. So when I think of the way forward, and I think the work for the Secretary done is enormous. For example, I was speaking to one of our colleagues here who was saying that uh, they, the contribution of that agency could be made in terms of advice, technical resources, if there could be a presentation made to that agency for the resources in which uh, are needed. And I can assure him that when this plan is put forward, there will be clarity about these resources, not necessarily financial, which his agency uh, 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 can support. So I see the work by the Secretariat in terms of the work ahead as, is clear. There's a lot of work to be done. And I think the main activities that can be foreseen for the immediate and medium-term future would fall into the two categories. I think that's quite clear from the presentation. There's, of course, resource mobilization with a caveat that resource mobilization has to be seen not only in terms of the optimum scenario, ideal scenario, the maximum scenario, but in terms of what is necessary for there to be a functioning institution initially, uh, a CAFA that uh, 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 puts a face before the Caribbean people. That is one of the major areas. And certain, second, uh, I repeat, this implementation to get an interim implementation team has to be the second most important of the things uh, 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 to be done and to have this technical cooperation uh, uh, plan put forward. And I, 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 I hope that uh, you who have come here as partners, I hope you've been pleased with the interchange. I hope you've been satisfied or you know where, you, uh, where to get it if you haven't been absolutely satisfied with the information presented to you. I hope you have been comforted by the uh, uh, demonstration that they, as the Prime Minister said, there has been, that there is momentum. I hope you've been comforted by the clear indication that that momentum is building. I hope you've been comforted by the fact that so many of you have expressed support for this uh, is institution, institution. And if I could repeat what both Dr. Walcott and Dr. Green have said in terms of what we would require of you, uh, one, to stay engaged. And staying engaged is a two-way street. I would hope that I know that the Secretariat will be sending you information about how this progresses, and I will hope that you will take the responsibility of engagement as being uh, responding 
to those uh, indications, those, those, uh, that information from the Secretariat. Give me your opinion. If you think it is damn nonsense, say it is damn nonsense, but at least give some indication of what you think of the information that is sent, sent to you. I can't emphasize more uh, what uh, has been said in terms of the role of, of, of champ being a champion uh, uh, for CAFA. You have a stake, you now have a stake in this enterprise. You have a stake in this enterprise. And the success of this enterprise will depend in no small measure to, on the extent to which you support and you champion it. And uh, I repeat, the provision of technical expertise at your disposal will be gratefully re uh, received and very, very faithfully applied. And let me end where I began, that this partners uh, meeting is not a pleasant occasion. But I trust that those of you who have influence in the circles in which you move will use your good offices to advocate for support for CARA, for, for, for CARFA, will, with the full knowledge that it is going to happen and it is going to be the kind of institution that on which the Caribbean people and the region can have some pride. So thank you all very much for coming. And uh, we will see you all with bells and whistles at the reception this evening at the Mexon Presente y Decente. Thank you very much indeed. We will now adjourn. Thank you.